Welcome to Gay USA. I'm Andy Hum. I'm Ann Northrup. And in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and protests by hundreds of thousands of people nationwide and around the world, the movement to end police brutality against people of color is finally getting some traction. Our guest is veteran activist J.W. Walker of Rise and Resist and the Reclaim Pride Coalition and Gays Against Guns. And the Reclaim Pride March in New York is on again for June 28th as the Queer Liberation March for Black Lives and Against Police Brutality. Uh, we learned uh, that the Bronx District Attorney will not bring charges against the New York City Jail where trans woman Laileen Pol Polanco uh, died one year ago. Hideous. Uh, and speaking of hideous, in a White House full of racist and anti-LGBT bigots, Trump managed to find three more to add to the staff of the U.S. Uh, uh, why AID, Agency it? for International it's Development. Thank you, I got it. A South Carolina lesbian teen at a public high school is stopped from participating in her graduation because she wouldn't put on a dress. Crazy. Uh, trans pioneer Georgina Beyer got a high honor in New Zealand from the Queen of England. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe, Justice Smith, and Adam Rippon uh, uh, take on transphobes and homophobes around the world. Uh, but of course, our main conversation today at the beginning is all about what's happening here in the United States and around the world uh, in support of Black Lives Matter and in horror at what happened to George Floyd being murdered by the police and of course all the other murders through centuries of black people. So we are joined happily by our friend, uh, J.W. Walker. Jay has been an activist uh, for decades and is currently working as an organizer with Rise and Resist, the Reclaim Pride Coalition, and Gays Against Guns. Uh, thanks, Jay. Great to have you here today. Hi, hi, Anne. Hi, Andy. Thank you for having me. So what's it like out there in the streets? What's, what's your experience been over the last week, for instance? Uh, it's been incredibly exciting. It's been moving uh, beyond belief just to see this, uh, this outpouring of, of, of people, of New Yorkers, just sustaining this for, you know, for pretty much an enti the entirety of two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've been so impressed. I've, I've just been thrilled about it. Um, you know, obviously, uh, this this, uh, this sort of outpouring is is uh, it's unique. It's new. It feels like we're back in the 1960s again, where you've got everybody across the country and across the globe coming out in protest to these very real social ills. So I'm, it gives me a, 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 a jot of optimism. And well, it does, it does remind me of the actually specifically the anti-war movement in the 60s because that was a question of growing critical mass in the streets against the war to actually get it to end which it did but here we're talking 400 years of history and more and uh, a much bigger scope uh, do you tell us what you've seen specifically um I've certainly seen uh, very aggressive NYPD officers. Uh, I'll give you a, a great example. Uh, there was a one march um, which ended up marching west on 14th Street, uh, you know, for a moment. And while I was marching over there, I saw a young guy with a bike uh, ride past me, and a young woman who was walking next to me said, "Did you see what they were doing to that guy back? You know, you know." Or, earlier back uh, back at the other end of the block and I said no she said a police car was coming through and was like playing chicken with him was just sort of like starting up and slowing down and starting up and slowing down and making this guy on the bike feel like he was going to get run over and uh, I said oh my gosh it's terrible and so when I got back down to, when we got to the end of 14th Street uh, we saw the the guy on the bike go over to the police officers and I guess he was complaining about the way that they had been you know doing this uh, little game of chicken with him, and the police officer immediately just grabbed him off the bike, threw him to the ground, six other cops jumped on top of him. You know, this wasn't post-curfew, this was at about 
five thirty um, in the afternoon. It was light. Kid was maybe a hundred twenty pounds, little young Latinx kid on a bike, and they just became violent for for his challenging their authority. I guess, um, and that's what I've been seeing that. Um, especially as the day goes on in the early evening, both before the curfew um, uh, was instituted uh, and after it was instituted, they start to get very violent as the day wears on. Um, and, you know, that's really troubling because a lot of protests are in the evening. Well, it's, it's, astonishing. it's astonishing that the police would be so violent and so brutal against people who are protesting police brutality. Yeah, it, it, it shows a really, la a really horrible lack of strategy on their part. Um, I would think that if I were a lieutenant or a commander and I was, um, you know, sort of getting uh, my platoon or squadron or phalanx or whatever they call themselves, uh, ready to go out into the streets at this moment, I would be telling them, you need to put your best foot forward. You need to be smiling. You need to take a knee when they, you know, like, like, it, like clearly some of these, uh, these uh, higher ups are telling their officers things like that because we do see those photo ops occurring every now and then. Um, but it, you know, the, the truth is that policing is, is chock full of white supremacists. Uh, it was founded essentially as a white supremacist supremacist institution to go around catching slaves. Uh, the FBI, you know, put out a report 14 years ago saying that white supremacists were actively infiltrating police forces to both recruit and to stop crimes committed by white supremacists from being investigated and to stop people from being arrested. I mean, we know all of that. It's, it, it's all, you know, it's all just basic facts. Um, so in the, on the other sense, we're not particularly surprised. Well, you uh, grew up in Virginia. You've lived here for a long time, but uh, and you're in your early fifties. What, what has your experience been with the police over the decades? Um, uh, I'd say that I I never really had bad experiences with police in the town that I grew up in. Um, I, that's actually it's it's probably more of a of the town that I grew up in, which was a very even though it was in southeastern Virginia, it was a very strangely racially calm uh, area, and that's partially because we have military bases. We had, uh, you know, uh, Hampton University, which is a major um, historically black uh, university, um, and we had um, one of the first contraband camps after um, during the Civil War, which is where runaway slaves could run to any Union-held military base and uh, you know not be turned back over um, to their enslavers. Uh, one of the first contraband camps was right there next to my town, and so the town just had a weird little little history. Um, but uh, in New York, on the other hand, <laughs> uh, where I've lived for the last 34, uh, 34 almost thirty-five years. I have had numerous, um, numerous uh, situations where police have, uh, you know, uh, run up on me, thrown me against the wall because I, uh, because I fit the description of a suspect, uh, which of course I never found out what the suspect actually looked like. And so, um, but, um, you know, I've had, I've had numerous interactions. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I've had numerous negative interactions um, with police, and certainly as an activist, uh, I've had, um, I've had, I've seen a lot of situations where police, uh, rather than uh, seeking to calm the situation, they they absolutely have an intention, it seems, to escalate a situation, to provoke violence, so that they can theoretically, I guess, uh, get more arrests and excuse their own violence. Well, the police in New York seem to want to just control everything, uh, you know, whereas with the Queer Liberation March last year, uh, they had all the personnel on the other march and they let it pretty much let us march uptown unmolested. And we didn't need that many police to be protected and et cetera. But let's get back to um, uh, what's happening now. Why is everything, why are we getting traction now? Why is this movement really seems to be, uh, well, has provoked 
actual change. They're passing bills uh, to, to, to rein in the police. Why do you think that's happening now? You know, I, you know it's, it's a trite expression. Uh, I've heard it a lot and I agree with it. We kind of had a perfect storm situation. We have a presidential election year. We have had two years of this incredible youth and mostly white youth led movement, the March for Our Lives that has been going around for the last year, registering young people to vote, speaking to them about issues. We have the intersectionality of the three and a half years of the Trump administration, which has done a great deal to inform uh, non-black uh, uh, activists about a lot of the issues that black people are facing when it comes to law enforcement and policing, because this three and a half years has sort of brought all of these formerly siloed, uh, you know, pe people with these uh, very particular interests has brought us all together because we've all been fighting against Donald Trump for three and a half years. Then on top of that, you overlay two and a half months of people being um, uh, sheltering in place in their homes, being fearful about a disease, having their economic lives interrupted, having their social lives interrupted, having all of this angst and tension built up in them. And then, you know, then we have the, the, the situations with Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor coming to the forefront um, two months two and a half months after the actual crimes were committed, people being shocked that nothing was done, that nobody knew about uh, about them until two and a half months of the parents begging for media coverage, begging for social media uh, um, uh, uplift to get the story out. And as we're dealing with all of that, um, uh, we see eight minutes and 46 seconds of a man being murdered before our eyes. We see the life go out of his eyes and we see a completely callous police officer with his hand casually in his pocket, slowly killing this man. And, you know, it, that was the flashpoint. That was the moment. That was what was needed to ignite this fire. And uh, it's going to burn. And to attract the mainstream support for Black Lives Matter as never before. Exactly, exactly, because it was, it was such an undeniably horrific act that these, that, the, that not just this one cop, that these four cops all participated actively in murdering this man and, and did so while people are yelling at them, you're killing him. You're killing him. Stop it. Stop it. Why are you doing this? He's handcuffed. Leave him alone. Get off of him. You're killing him. And for, for eight minutes, people are yelling at them, get, you know, and, and they had such callous disregard. And I heard one of the reporters at the press conference with the Minneapolis police chief today say, I went to the priest, uh, I talked to people in the area and the precinct, he was known as one of the better ones. <laughs> this is what they said. And it's the, the, the whole police department there, which is why they want to rebuild it from the ground up, is awful. Mm -hmm. It's awful, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and we know apparently that Chauvin and, and Big Floyd worked in the same nightclub as Mousers and apparently didn't get along. And so it may very well be that this gets ratcheted up as it's already gotten ratcheted up from third degree murder to second degree murder. It might actually get ratcheted up from second degree to first uh, to first. I mean, who knows? Um, you know, but just the, the fact that they just just knew that there were cameras pointed at all of them. In that, in that moment in time, and nothing, it did not occur to them to stop killing this fellow while they've got cameras on them. It's just, it's absurd. Well, it's sort of the definition of white supremacy. Uh, yeah. that you don't have to be accountable for killing a black man uh, openly on the street in front of everyone. And I think that this is a movement that might have lost a little steam except that the police are still doing it on a daily basis everywhere. When you see cops uh, coming after reporters and the reporters are saying, wait, wait, I'm just a reporter here. And the cops say to them, we don't care. And mm -hmm. firing uh, rubber bullets at them. Uh, when, uh, when they you know, throw peaceful protesters off the uh, street in front of the White House with tear gas and and rubber bullets and other uh, explosives. It, to make way for a photo op. 
they, yeah, they they won't stop. They just keep yeah. doing this. And well, I I wonder about. Uh, I'm concerned about the longevity of the movement. I'm thrilled that things are happening now. I'm shocked to see things like you know members of Congress kneeling with kente cloth around. Their neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little surprise. That was a little much. A little much. Yeah, I would have preferred zoot suits. I would have preferred all the men in zoot suits. Because that's an American tradition. Maybe orange jumpsuits. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I wonder if you have any sense. You're active in a lot of groups. You're out there on the streets. Uh, do you think this can be sustained over so enough time to get rid of Trump, to make some real change, to really uh, uh, rein in the power of the police is... Is any of that possible? I honestly, and that's what I was saying earlier when I said that I had a, a jot of, of optimism. Um, I think that it really is. I think that this really is a, uh, a like a watershed moment right now for this movement. And the, the, what has happened while we couldn't get anything done, right, for all of this time that we couldn't get anything done, is all of these small, locally based and national organizations have been formulating plans, have been in communication, have been connecting with other groups, like I said, with the whole intersectionality piece that, that you know, weren't focused on these, have been getting the word out. So all of this stuff has been going on in the background as an undercurrent of the general resistance, you know, movement in this country for, you know, for, for a number of years. And so I think that a lot of these groups were incredibly prepared. Um, my friends at Black Lives Matter, Greater New York, just released an amazing agenda um, uh, on their this new initiative they have at blackopportunities.org that uh, it just is a line-by-line a line, a rundown of all uh, of the list of, of uh, reform demands that I think that everyone in the progressive world is going, is going to agree with. And already, elected officials are already trying to get some of those things instituted right now. Well, you're not out there marching through the streets saying, we want reform. You're saying defund the police. And Absolutely. I've heard all this hand wringing from a lot of, you know, older activists. Oh, we're going to lose the election. This is going to be used against us. So Trump is going to get us for this. You know, for, but it's, it, it is the thing that has moved everybody. I mean, you have already gotten action, certainly from the New York State Legislature. Uh, more transparency on police. Uh, banning chokehold, making it a criminal act to engage in a chokehold, these kinds of things, also the New York City Council. So, um, you know, why are people afraid of this? Yeah, I think that, I think that people have, a, a, and rightly so, a, uh, a, a, an extraordinary distrust for our political system. Um, you know, we've seen time and time again where, you know, Bill de Blasio is a perfect example. Um, when he was running for his first term, when he was running for his first term, no, when he was running for the nomination, actually, when he was running, I guess, in the primary for, for, for mayor, um, I happened, at the time I worked on West 72nd Street, and I used to go to the, come through Verity Square a lot when I was going to get my lunch, and he would frequently have his, you know, campaign people in Verity Square on 72nd and Broadway, um, you know, handing out leaflets, talking to people, asking people questions, and I remember going at one of them approaching me and me saying at the time, listen, I'm a one issue voter, whichever candidate comes out strongest against stop and frisk says that they are going to end stop and frisk in the city. That's going to be the candidate that gets my vote in the primary. Um, and I imagine that they heard that from a lot of people because within a week of, of me having that interaction, the Dante commercial came out and uh, with Dante his son. Explain that's his African-American son. That is his. That is his, bi his biracial son, Dante, um, uh, with the great big fro, uh, coming out and talking about stop and frisk, and that is what got Bill De Blasio the, um, the the mayoralty. And then, as soon as he got in as the mayor, he brings in Bratton, who's a leftover from Giuliani, you know, broken windows policy originating, stone cold typical NYPD white supremacist cop uh, to be the police commissioner, passing over um, uh, a, a black police chief who was kind, who's, was kind of second in, in command 
under the prior. Uh, and then he went on to pass over that same black police chief two more times up until uh, up until the current time. And yet, um, yeah. yet de Blasio was totally resistant to these reforms up until a week ago. Mm -hmm. And saying, okay, we're going to cut the budget, we're going to do this, we're going to, you know, et cetera. They saw the tea leaves. The, the reason is, and this is the one thing that people aren't talking about in the, in the whole uh, defund, abolish, all, you know, reform uh, talk, is the reason that these elected officials don't come out more strongly against police is that they all have to rely on the police for their own personal and their family's protection. Mm -hmm. That those things need to be decoupled because, uh, you know, we know there have been crooked cops. We know that cops have done really, really bad things under cover of their badge. And so if I were an elected official and had to rely on these guys with guns to protect my life, I might be afraid to say wow. what really needed to be said to, um, to reform them. So I think that that's something that folks are gonna have to talk about is sort of getting the police out of the business of protecting politicians. Uh, and the DAs are also even more dependent on the cops yes. uh, to get on the stand and lie and make their case. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm kind of thrilled that this discussion of defund the police is going on because I think a lot of people, including myself, I will say, uh, have been uh, educated acutely about out of the sort of knee jerk thing of, well, of course we need, you know, cops to protect us and, and being pulled up short to admit that, in fact, the cops may cause more problems than they solve and that it is important to rethink the role of the police and maybe farm a lot of that out to others and, and really reduce their functions. And, and I'm glad we're having that conversation. But I also heard something last night as we tape on Wednesday, and that is, don't laugh at me, the Oprah Winfrey, where do we go from here conversation, part two tonight. Uh, and specifically towards the end, uh, Ava DuVernay and uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones of the New York Times saying, look, all this uh, talk about reducing the role of the cops is great, but that is not going to solve the issues of uh, uh, white supremacy or income inequality or the second class status of black citizens in this country, in this world. And one thing we got to do is start talking about reparations. We have to level the playing field because the income inequality is just this massive, massive problem that we are ignoring at the moment. Uh, your thoughts, Jay? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that reparations is a conversation that needs to be had. I think it's been bubbling up closer to the surface, I think in a large part because of the forward movement and forward momentum that the Black Lives Matter and the movement for Black Lives generally have, have had over the course of the last, <coughs> excuse me, um, four or five years, especially, especially these, these uh, last three and a half under Trump. Um, it's a long conversation and that's, as much as I think that the conversation needs to be had, I, I think that we sometimes get stuck having conversations rather than doing things, rather than actually making actual changes. And conversations can go on for decades and things cannot get done. We've been having a conversation about police brutality for my entire life and nothing actually has been done. So I, I feel that um, it is time it, it, that we have to concentrate right now um, on the actions, at least those of us in the activist community and those progressive politicians or people who are in positions to actually uh, move legislation, what have you, we've got to we've got to actually do the work um, well, of, of enacting real legislation. Well, when the stock market tanked in March and corporations went bankrupt, the Congress came up with trillions of dollars yeah. in five minutes. To like that. for them and come on so they can act when they want to now yeah. the other big issue that you work on is guns and we're on we're at the fourth anniversary of the pulse massacre uh, this friday and you're with gays against guns and that is an issue where we haven't <coughs> much action other than at the state level to some extent <coughs> and we should say there's going to be your gays against guns going to have a uh, virtual 
commemoration at 6.30 on Friday online, gazeagainstguns.net, and the One Pulse Foundation at 7 o'clock out of Orlando, also a virtual thing. But what about the gun issue? Yeah, well, and the gun issue is so deeply tied into all of the drama that the world has been going through over the course of the last three months. Um, when when the uh, folks decided that their economic freedom was uh, supposedly under threat by the COVID lockdown, it was the gun nutters who were the ones that started storming state capitals. And that's because of a, a sort of astroturf movement by uh, three uh, brothers who have been funding a lot of this uh, uh, pro-gun uh, online activity. They're the ones that sort of fomented this whole rebellion at the state capitals. And of course, it was a bunch of people carrying guns. Um, you know, to the point that black legislators um, had to have their black constituents show up, escorting them, in some cases, highly armed. Um, you know, and of course, the, the history of the civil rights movement is, is very much tied up in unequal access to firepower. Um, and uh, the history of black activists having to use guns to fend off then Klansmen off from their homes. Um, but we're also dealing with the reality of the United States of America. And the fact is that we have more guns in this country than we have people. Um, we have people that do not, do not use guns in the right way, do not manage their firearms in the right way so that their children end up getting hold of them and killing and, and, and accidentally killing themselves, killing each other. Um, we've got thickness in this culture um, and you know we've had we've had this this sickness of COVID running rampant through our country. We've had this sickness of white supremacy and racism running rampant through our country for its entire existence, and the sickness of of uh, of, of guns uh, is well, maybe just you as can make, maybe you can make an alliance with the police. They tend to be in favor of gun control. I was going to say, except when they're using them to kill black people. They're the <laughs> guns taken away. Uh, yeah. Well, great. So uh, you will be telling us more about uh, guns and the uh, Gays Against Guns movement on Friday at on your Pulse. Uh, uh, yes. Broadcast. And there will be links to all these events in our email. So sign up for our email at gayusatv.org. Get on our list. More and more of you are. And uh, we will send you the links to all these events in Orlando yeah. and in New York. And Jay, go take a nap so you can get back out on the streets. I will, but don't forget, all your viewers need to know about the Queer Liberation March for Black Lives and Against Police Brutality on Sunday, June 28th. <laughs> Starts at 1 o'clock. Location to be announced. <laughs> That's the latest news, but there will be more news as we go <laughs> on all of that. And I would refer you to Jay's uh, um, Facebook page because he posted a wonderful thing about how you can take care of yourself as an activist. Uh, right. Yes. Go ahead. Do another minute on that, and then we'll let you go. Oh yeah, I, I you know, um, these are very, very tense times, and when you're working in activism, you're feeling a lot of the emotions of the moment, and you're dealing with a lot of people that are working together, all of whom are feeling the emotions of the moment, but each of them applying the reality of the moment to their own lives and having their own reflections. And sometimes things get a little out of hand and people say things that they probably wouldn't in less stressful times. Uh, and so it's always really important to remember, um, remember that you're, you're, you're in community with folks for a reason. And that reason is more important than these momentary uh, issues, interpersonal issues that can come up every now and then. Um, and so, you know, I, I've, I've said for years because I've seen it up close, that the biggest enemy to progressive ad, uh, activism, it isn't the man, and it isn't the uh, activists arguing on the other side against progressive movement. The biggest enemy of, of progressive activism is ego, is when we center ourselves too much in the work that we're trying to do, rather than centering the work and trying to remove ourselves from the equation. Um, so yeah, I'm just sort of encouraging people to keep that stuff in mind because we have to keep it together. We have to hold the line uh, from now to November 
so just I want everyone to take care of themselves and to to embrace and and embrace everyone that they're working with and look at the look at our work with love and, and continue it with love. Thank you, Jay. Perfectly Let's said. Uh, probably till January twentieth, because God knows what He can do, even as good a good point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, with us so much, so much. Okay. Uh, see you tonight on another conference call. I'll see you tonight. <laughs> bye bye. Bye, Jay. All right. Well, I mean, we talked about a lot of the other things that are happening in the state legislatures and things. One of the things they're doing in New York is the Chris Cooper bill creating a private right of action if someone calls the cops on you based on bias. Of course, I think it should be a crime to make a false report to the police, but this is some progress. And are they really gonna call it the Chris Cooper bill? Well, that's what, that's what they're calling it in the press because that's what it's, that's what it's based on. Immortality. Uh, well, I, I, we, I don't know that we're totally organized on our thoughts on this, uh, so I'm gonna let the thing that is most upsetting to me at the moment rise to the top. And that is the actions of the police in various uh, confrontations around the uh, country. And one thing I've been reading about is uh, a few incidents, uh, one in Asheville, North Carolina, another in Raleigh, North Carolina, another in Des Moines, Iowa, and, uh, and of course what we see everywhere around the country. And that is the police just viciously, viciously with deep anger attacking completely peaceful situations. And the two incidents in North Carolina and the one in Iowa were, uh, happened uh, in town, peaceful people, not even protesters, just local people, some at a gay bar in one place, others, other citizens. They are trying to help protesters who've been tear gassed. And so they set up a table outside a bar with water and uh, uh, milk and uh, washcloths to wash out their eyes when they get attacked by the police. And the police sweep in uh, with guns drawn, force the helpers out of the way, and then destroy the medical equipment, punching water bottles to empty them, claiming that the water bottles are weapons and they have to destroy them. Oh, and then there was the one uh, where the cops were going around. Oh, this was in Minneapolis. Uh, stabbing everybody's tires in a parking lot. All four tires on cars just parked in the parking lot on the grounds that, well, these could be dangerous items. People could get in these cars and come after us. And so they went around the parking lot and systematically destroyed all four tires on every car in that parking lot. This is the kind of thing that is just making me nuts these days. We, we had a little progress in, in Tallahassee uh, with the police. Uh, the police union lost their bid to keep secret the name of the cop who shot and killed trans man Tony McDay. Uh, but the attorney general still has to review this before it's going to come out. But the police say the officer acted in according with training, but the witnesses said there were no warning when they shot the Tony to death, trans man. And meanwhile, we've just gotten the uh, decision in New York from the Bronx District Attorney that she is not going to bring any charges against the Correction Department or the Rikers Island Jail for the death a year ago of Laylene Polanco, a black trans woman who was arrested for sex work, couldn't afford the $500 bail, uh, so she was in there in the prison uh, for an extended period, and she had epilepsy, and they knew that. She there she is. Uh, she it is seven years old. Fully disclosed to the police, they knew all about it. Well, guess what? She started having. She was put in solitary confinement. She started having seizures, but they didn't see it because they weren't checking on her at the required intervals. They left her alone for too long. And when they finally went to do a periodic check, she was dead. And the Bronx DA is not bringing any charges. And this is the kind of thing that goes on systematically in the system. And the, and the LGBT anti-violence project is demanding no more solitary confinement 
repeal the ban on walking while trans. It's an old anti-loitering bill that they use to arrest anybody almost on any pretext for stopping for a second. Uh, and stop the uh, uh, now and stop the rollbacks on bail reform. We did do bail reform in New York, and it became controversial. And they were going to like roll it back this year. They better not. Well, certainly, someone like this should not be held in terrible conditions because she can't afford five hundred dollars bail. There. And in Minneapolis, a black trans woman, uh, Iana Dior, twenty-one, was attacked by a mob of 15 men at a gas station after a fender bender. Uh, there apparently is video about, about this, and nobody's posting it because it's just so brutal. Um, the, uh, you know, it's a, just, a, just a horrible, horrible thing, anti-trans attack on this woman. Uh, years old. Yeah. Um, uh, well, there, oh. And then, uh, I don't know that we've talked about this, but there were some uh, protesters, uh, New York protesters, ACT UP protesters, uh, beaten viciously by the cops. Yeah. I, I have a, a friend who I was talking to about this the other night, and she said, uh, the cops are not beating anyone. And I said, are you kidding me? Just Google police beating protesters, and you'll see how it is happening viciously everywhere. Batons just whacking people. Uh, one guy, Jason Rosenberg, had his arm broken, bloody head, nine staples in his head, no medical uh, help while he was under arrest for 11 hours. Uh, Plus, in the midst of COVID, they're throwing these people into packed uh, prison, prison uh, holding pens and, and, and risking things. You yeah. also have a picture of what happened when they started to open up things in New York a bit outside the uh, a gay bar in yeah. Hell's Kitchen, a big crowd of, uh, of guys on the street. Now, now, people are appalled by this. I mean, you know, sometimes the picture makes people look closer together than they ought to be, but you don't see enough masks on there. And the, these, these are a lot of... Uh, uh, of men. It's a lot of men. It is men. I don't see uh, hardly... I know. It's, it's all men. They've been apart for a long time. Anyway. Uh, can I give you some good news? Uh, you know, we talked about the death of Lou Sheldon, the anti-gay leader last week who died on May 29th. But I was encouraged to read that his Traditional Values Coalition website went dark back in 2017. <laughs> well, that is good. All right. Uh, I, I can run down some uh, less, less brutal news. Uh, well, uh, but as a transition, L.A., Los Angeles, uh, we told you months ago when the whole coronavirus thing started that uh, pride parades all over the country, all over the world were being canceled because of this, and including the one in LA, big pride parade there every year. So they canceled. But recently they decided uh, that no, they would hold a, a parade or march uh, devoted to Black Lives Matter uh, and those issues. And so they announced this, and everybody goes, wow, that's pretty progressive of them. But then it turns out they asked for a permit. They said how happy they were to be working with the police. They invited corporate support, and the world blew up all over again for them. Uh, they were going to march with the police. Yes. And so people just lost their minds, and now it's canceled again for their involvement. They have stepped back. They have put uh, black activists in charge who are saying no cops, no permit, uh, no marching with the police, no corporations, and we will do this differently. But the L.A. Pride people have just uh, been humiliated by this. The uh, Heritage of Pride people here in New York are, you know, they have a two-hour extravaganza with uh, Billy Porter and Janelle Monet, uh, who are both very political, I hope they say something pro political, on Sunday the 28th, but they don't seem to yet, we haven't heard anything yet from them about them making any big changes in their celebrity emphasis. They are supposed to do some kind of rally online on, uh, this is all online with them, uh, Friday night the 27th, that may be a little more political. We'll give you those details. Got a special on WABC, the local station, but that's that seems to Sunday. be dominated. That's the Sunday broadcast with the celebrities. Tends to be dominated by the corporate sponsors. 
corporate sponsors and celebrities. So the but the Queer Liberation March will be this year out in the streets, uh, also live streamed online. And as Jay said, we think we've just settled on a 1 p.m. starting time. We are having a meeting tonight to uh, try to finalize some details about the route and the time and how we're going to do this. Uh, but we are going to be marching and uh, with, with masks, with masks, with social distancing, an attempt to keep everybody safe. But we want to be out in the street and we look at these protest marches and we say, why not us? Why shouldn't we bring these same messages uh, to this community and to everyone? So it will be the Queer Liberation March for Black Lives and against police brutality. And we will have an agenda that talks about those issues, uh, I hope, in some depth and detail. Why That'll not us? You ask why not us? Because we're old. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I want to be there with the sign at, on the sidelines, you know, holding it up. And then I want to I want to get way in the back where I can create some distance. Or I want to create keep creating distance. I've been working hard at not getting this virus. Me too. But that'll be Sunday, June 28th, uh, traditional Pride Day. The only problem is, as you mentioned earlier, last year we had very few cops with us because they were all uh, at the World Pride 50th anniversary march. My fear is that they'll be more available to be harassing us this time. Invite all, invite all the other, you're inviting all the other groups to participate who are protesting, yes? Everyone. Okay. All right. Oh, so we're also terrified that it's going to be huge, and that's not uh, necessarily safe. So, some happy medium there, I hope. Some uh, some national news, Trump news. Did we talk last week about how uh, the DOJ went to the Department of Justice is arguing at at the Supreme Court that I I don't think we went into it in depth. Not that they haven't done it at every level every week, but well, they are they are arguing in favor of that of taxpayer-funded Catholic groups being allowed to refuse to work with same-sex parents. And again, it, we're not optimistic about these cases, the way the Supreme Court has been going. You know, if, if a private group wants to, to do what they're going to do in a religious group, but don't take my money to do it. All right. And then the other big Trump story is um, USAID, the U.S. Agency for International Development. Now, this is the group that works overseas uh, this is the group that hires Franklin Graham to do so much work overseas. Right. And they have hired all these people uh, to, who are horribly anti-gay. This woman, Merritt Corrigan, I had not heard of her, a right-wing activist. She wrote that America's homo empire couldn't tolerate even one commercial enterprise not in full submission to the tyrannical LGBT ad agenda. She's... Um, she says, feminism has reduced uh, women to cheap imitations of men. <laughs> now, the, the USAID's own website says they're committed to a world where LGBT people can live free of discrimination and violence. But Trump has stacked this group with bigots. It's just unbelievable what he's managed to accomplish in three and a half years. He's been much more ambitious than any other president. Agreed. He, you know, he, he takes advantage of all those things. When you know what you want and you uh, have a Senate that's uh, willing to give you full support, the sky's the limit. So uh, some the other thing, of course, this week uh, that he's undoubtedly involved in is voter suppression in these elections, the primary elections we saw this week, Georgia, a debacle, uh, so upsetting and disturbing. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, can they fix it before November? Sure. Will they? Whole other question. Okay. All right. Uh, some political news in uh, West Virginia. They, West Virginia, Trump's biggest state. Uh, they have elected the first transgender elected official, Rosemary Ketchum, right? Is that it? Yeah. Yep. She won a seat on the Wheeling City Council. First out transgender official. There should be three challengers there. You got a picture of her there, uh, Rich? Oh. Rosemary Ketchum. Yeah, we're hopscotching around, but he'll get it up there. Uh, Rosemary Ketchum. There she is. First out trans uh, elected official in West Virginia. There are, I think, three other out LGB officials in West Virginia. But this is a real first, and congratulations for that. In New York, we're having a primary on June 23rd, Democratic primary. And... Uh, 
You know, in the South Bronx congressional seat that's opening up, Ruben Diaz Sr., the notorious anti-LGBT bigot with an evangelical base, is the leading candidate there because there are, there are like six progressive candidates. The leading one in, happens to be an out gay guy named Richie Torres who's on the city council. He's closest in the polls to, to Diaz Sr. He is endorsed this week by Chris Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> In the Daily News. We're, we're never going to get Chris back here. He's, uh, he's transcended us. He's going, uh, going worldwide, I think. Well, he says Torres is at the intersection of equality and justice as an out gay Latino. There you go. Well, as long as we're talking about politicians, let's talk about our favorite from South Carolina, Lindsey Graham, who we now understand is known as Lady G. Uh, aside from uh, dyeing his hair to be so lovely and more like, more like the color of Trump's, people are saying. Oh, it's much better than Trump's. Trump's is uh, is a clown head, but uh, Lindsay has really spruced himself up. <laughs> but at the same time, there's this guy named Sean Harding, who is a sex worker, and he has come out using his name and said, you know, there is a, a politician uh, who's totally in league with Trump, uh, initials LG, and he is known to every sex worker within, what, a thousand miles. He's hired all of them. And I am ready to out him, but I can't do it alone. I need other sex workers who have worked for him to come out and say it. So now the blogs at least are on this. The mainstream press has still not uh, dared to uh, get into this, but this, is, this could gain some traction if some more people have uh, the courage to come out and tell what they know about Lindsey Graham. And talk about your lesbian sister in South Carolina. Well, this is a young woman uh, named, I got it, uh, Denisha Clark. Uh, she is a high school senior who was about to graduate. She is an out lesbian at Lamar High School in Darlington County. And she showed up for the graduation ceremony uh, wearing pants because she's an out lesbian and that's what she wears. And she was told she could not march in the graduation uh, parade. Uh, so she was forced to stand outside the ceremony at a fence uh, outside everything that was happening. But she stood there because she wanted to at least hear her name announced as one of the graduates. Nope, no announcement of her name. She was totally erased from the entire graduation ceremony because she wouldn't wear a dress to the festivities. Who wears a dress anymore? 40 years ago, I remember my mother putting a skirt on uh, and one of her grandchildren, little kids said, Grandma, you don't have your pants on. <laughs> All right. Uh, other politics. Um, the Biden campaign announced their LGBTQ steering committee. Oh, yeah. You know, blah, blah, blah. But they're, you know, the HRC, other groups, they're investing a lot of money in the swing states where um, they say 50% of LGBT voters are Democrats, 15% are registered as Republicans, and of course, a lot of independents. The Biden site has a whole platform of issues. You can take a look at that and see whether you think it's adequate. He also has an advisory council, which includes uh, almost every LGBT uh, member of Congress, with two notable exceptions. Uh, Chris, Kirsten Sinema, the out bisexual senator from Arizona, is not on the list at this point. And neither, uh, that didn't surprise me so much because she casts a lot of conservative votes. Uh, but Representative Mark Pocan from Wisconsin, who represents Tammy Baldwin's old uh, district there and is quite progressive, but he's not on the list. So I don't know if that's just a timing thing and he hasn't gotten around to it yet or what, but everyone else is on the advisory council list. We want to mourn the, one of our uh, pioneers in the community, uh, George Bacan. I, I, uh, B A K A N, 79 years old. He was the founder of the Seattle Gay News. He died on Monday at his desk, working on a letter to the city from LGBT leaders against police brutality. He was a big advocate for very involved with marriage equality, affordable LGBTQ senior housing, editor in chief of this paper for four decades. 
During the AIDS crisis in the early days, Page published free pages and pages of obituaries. Uh, but in 2012, he played a major role in passing a statewide referendum upholding legislation that opened marriage to gay couples. It passed 54 to 46. He will be missed. He was described with adjectives like passionate, colorful, eccentric, uh, loud, and gentle. So, uh, Guide in the saddle. Yeah. Uh, How about that Jerry Falwell Jr.? <laughs> God. <laughs> he, he's on. Uh, by the, and well, uh, and let's go to Alaska, I think, is on our list here. It is. Uh, yeah. Well, it's the old story, and yet it happens again. Uh, a florist in Ketchikan, Flor uh, Alaska, uh, got a call from a woman who said she wanted to order flowers for a wedding. Uh, it's a wedding of two men. Do you have any trouble with that? And the florist hesitated for a minute and said, yeah, I do have a problem with that. Uh, and refused it, and that led to a big demo of a couple hundred people outside the florist. Uh, I'm not, is, that, is this uh, going to court uh, in any way, or just? I, I don't know. The, the demonstrators, and it was huge for Ketchikan, Alaska, yeah. but they said, we just wanted to show our love for the couple. I so have a little problem with the parent who called. Uh, I've always believed that uh, you want to uh, make something real by by just acting as if it is real. So I think if you call a florist to order flowers for a wedding, you say, uh, I would like to order flowers for a wedding. And if they want the names of the people getting married, you say, okay, it's Mike and it's Harry and uh, that's the wedding. And then if the florist wants to object, it takes more effort for them to object. If you say to them, uh, are you okay with this? Is this, uh, uh, are you all right? That invites the florist to say, no, I'm not okay. Because uh, I, I think uh, I think she was just trying to avoid having a fight when it came to that, if they were relying on the florist and then the florist said, ooh. You know. Well, uh, if you give the names, then the florist uh, is gonna Maybe. have the opportunity to say something at some point, but the point is you don't invite people to discriminate. And I think if you treat yourself and your relationships and what you're doing as natural, that is likely to invite people to see it as natural and come along with you. I think you have a better success rate if you do. Well, are we moving to international news? Uh, be my guest, I okay. mean. Well, uh, Georgina Beyer, we've told you about her over the years, 62 years old, the, world, the, the world's first trans mayor, uh, was made a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit by Queen Elizabeth. Now she's calling, speaking of how to approach issues, she says she calls on trans people to inform and educate as they go along to get things done, rather than wagging their finger and getting angry. You've got to be patient because these things take time. Go ask any women's activist. She wondered if there would actually ever be total equality uh, for both trans people and women. Uh, she's also a Maori, uh, she, but she did a lot of things. Uh, she decriminalized prostitution. She, she won civil unions way before marriage equality. She's quite a pioneer. Uh, and also, and in the, back in the UK, the home of the queen, uh, JK Rowling is in more trouble for making anti-trans statements. Uh, sneering at the phrase people who menstruate, which is a term to include uh, trans men who do, if they're depending on their hormone situation, uh, still menstruate. Uh, so she, she thinks, oh, please, you know. Uh, so Daniel Radcliffe, uh, who of course has made his name as Harry Potter, uh, uh, has criticized Rowling and has made a large donation to a uh, trans organization. And he wrote a very, he said, transgender women are women. Any statement to the contrary erases their identity and dignity. And he posted on the website of the Trevor Project, hi highlighting their guide to how to be an ally. And then uh, the actor Justice uh, Smith uh, from Get Down and Jur Jurassic World, he posted on Instagram supporting black gay lives and announced his relationship with Nicholas Ash. Choir boy. Very, very cute young man from Queen Sugar, for those in of you. New Orleans. Uh, he, he, uh, he marched in a Black Lives Matter protest, and he was disappointed when some wouldn't join in 
the chance of black trans lives matter and black queer lives matter. It was a very thoughtful post that he put up. And then, yeah. there's, the, uh, then there's the very angry post from Adam Rippon. So an Olympic skater named Alexei Yagudin posted that when he found out Adam Rippon donated to a charity that helps black trans people, Yagudin said he could not wait for people like Rippon to die. So Rippon donated another $1,000 to the Okra Project, with Okra Project, which is for trans folks that helps feed them as well. When the Russian tried to apologize, Rippon said he can take his apology, homophobia, transphobia, racist comments, and his Olympic gold medal and shove them up his, and you can imagine what the next word was. It wasn't nose. <laughs> I uh, we only have a couple of minutes, so uh, quickly. Two and a half. Uh, bad news from Switzerland, Chile, and Japan, all of which had uh, parliamentary or court decisions against same-sex couples. Uh, but also in Chile, lesbians who used assisted reproduction uh, have been recognized as legal parents. And Poland, the government is funding funding anti LGBT propaganda and claiming that Christians are being persecuted. Well, and in the, in the run-up to the election in Russia, uh, the referendum on July 1st, which would make Putin basically, pr you know, president for life or until 2036, they're running a vicious anti, they're running such a vicious anti-gay video that YouTube took it down. <laughs> And uh, just to polish off the celebrity news, uh, this, one of the stars of the TV show Riverdale, Lily Reinhart, has uh, come out as bisexual and as a supporter of Black Lives Matter. She uh, made a good uh, statement supporting them. I also want to, uh, last week I made a mistake towards the top of the show saying that Marion uh, Buddy, the uh, bishop of the Episcopal Church, was a lesbian. Uh, she is not, and I said so at the end of last week's show. I meant to repeat that correction at the beginning of this show so people who don't watch the end of the show would know I corrected it, but I'm late again. But uh, my apologies for the mistake. Not <coughs> well, She's still a hero. She certainly is. And Megan Rapino is also a hero, finally vindicated for her support of Colin Kaepernick. And uh, she has signed a letter supporting Black Lives Matter and uh, endorsing cutting funds for the police. And all the women's soccer team wants a repeal of the rule in the uh, soccer federation that you have to stand respectfully for the American. Uh, and and Commissioner Goodell in the NFL has, has had to uh, reverse himself on uh, the crackdown on uh, the protests of the of of racism in America and the women's soccer team also wants the men's basketball championship moved out of Idaho Utah Idaho because they have anti-trans we're, we're done we'll see you next week thank you for watching bye